Hi, if you like the video, please remember to subscribe. Welcome to the SCL Subject Composition and Light Photography Guide to the Minolta SRT 101 35mm Film SLR. Um, this camera um, has got a special place in my heart because it got me, I guess you might almost say, back into photography a few years ago. And um, it is probably one of the best cameras if you want to learn about photography and also if you want to get better at digital photography and you want to sort of try out um, film photography with the idea of getting it to maybe slow you down a little bit not take quite so many photos take more time think more and overall you know just get better photographs um so why is the srt 101 so good well it, it's full of history, which I'll talk about in a bit, um, but it's got all the great functions of a great manual focus uh, film SLR. It was one of the first, if not the first, uh, uh, 35mm film SLR to have something called through-the-lens metering um, at full aperture. So, so what that means is, and it might be, it's a little bit difficult for us these days to, to quite comprehend what you used to have to do, but... When our cameras want to see how much light there is in the scene to work out the exposure, obviously they just look at the light coming through the lens and you know set the aperture and the ISO and the shutter speed accordingly on a digital camera. But you know before the SRT 101, what you would have to do is if your camera had a built-in light meter, you'd have to point it at the scene. You'd have put your ISO in already because that'd be the value of your film, um, and you would then select your aperture. But the the problem. <laughs> was that the in order to meter the scene you had when you set the aperture the um the, the light meter would only work if the aperture blades were actually closed and if you've ever used depth of field preview on your camera you'll know that when the aperture blades close up to the proper aperture you want like f8 it becomes very very dim in the viewfinder um, and very difficult to focus and compose and, and do that sort of thing but with the srt 101 no matter what aperture you were set, whether you're at f16, f8, f22, the camera compensated this and always had the lens all the way open, um, say at f1.4, um, I think it is, yeah, on this 50mm standard lens, and would only shut the aperture blades down when it needed to take a photograph. So this was a really big step forward in the usability of uh, film cameras. Um, there is a amazing collection of lenses that you can have for you know quite reasonable prices for the SRT 101. Um, they're very old. I mean, you're looking this particular model here is probably pushing it for 40 years old. Um, but chances are, if you do pick one up, it will still work, and it'll teach you more about photography um, as it slows you down, makes you think about those 24 or 36 exposures than any dozen books on digital photography would. It's a real heavy blump. I mean, this is a solid metal, well, it's not, sorry, it's a metal bodied SLR, um, really chunky. You know, you feel that if you got into a tight situation, if you hit somebody with this, um, they wouldn't get up afterwards. It feels great in the hand and it does have some really advanced features for a camera of its age as well. Um, it has a mirror lockup for doing very steady shots at long uh, shutter speeds. Uh, it has depth of field preview as well. Um, but Maybe one of the deciding factors where you should consider something like an SRT 101 is that Minolta, I think anyway, are often seen as the forgotten camera manufacturer. Um, and the manual focus cameras they made, like the Minolta SRT 101 and its siblings, are kind of the forgotten cameras of the forgotten camera manufacturer. Because by the time Minolta was sold to Sony um, in 2006, the SRTs pretty much were, were long forgotten amongst the masses, apart from, you know, the die-hard users who really love them. Um, really importantly, the manual focus lenses that were that are used on these types of cameras aren't compatible, aren't directly compatible with the digital cameras or the autofocus cameras that came after. You know, if you've got Minolta Dynax or a Minolta Alpha or then a Sony Alpha DSLR, these uh, manual focus lenses don't fit, they're not compatible. You need to fit a lens adapter, a lens mount adapter, but that adapter must have an extra focal element in, which kind of spoils it, and which means that the prices of lenses haven't been artificially 
are kind of pushed up by people buying them to use them on digital cameras. Um, and I think probably a lot of uh, vintage sort of film uh, enth enthusiasts probably look more towards, you know, Nikon and Canon and probably Pentax than Minolta's. And I kind of see this as it's their loss, but it's really our, our gain. So if you want to learn about the technicalities of photography, ISO, shutter, aperture, all that sort of thing, without any electronics getting in the way, or just a minimal amount anyway, and you want to learn how to slow down, then I think the SRT 101 is an excellent choice. The SRT 101 came out in, uh, I think it was about 1966. And as I said, it was quite a revolutionary camera for his time. And in fact, Minolta, all the way through their history, were noted for being probably the, the, the camera manufacturer that changed the face of, especially digital, sorry, especially SLR photography the most. They were the first to introduce through the lens metering in like the SRT 101. They were the first to introduce a really workable um, autofocus system um, in, the, in their SLRs and um, they, I think they were the first to kind of really get involved in anti-shake in the body on their SLRs as well and uh, it's a real shame that they disappeared but all the good work was taken up by Sony basically they bought all the engineers and all the work to go with it and the reason why Minolta really or Konica Minolta as they were at the end kind of disappeared was because they didn't dive into uh, digital photography, specific, specifically digital SLR photography, quick enough. And, you know, the likes of Canon and Nikon um, just swamped, swamped it. And if you really think about it now, you know, as of 2014, it's only really now that Sony have caught up big time and offer almost as good as packages as Canon and Nikon do. And in fact, when it comes to low light capability and their digital SLRs, you might even say that Sony have started to overtake uh, the traditional digital manufacturers. But anyway, as I say, the, um, the SRT 101 came out in 1966 and they was in production about 10 years. So there's quite a lot of these models around. And there's also the little variants as well. I'm not going into to, going to go into the intricacies of how you can work out how old your one is. There's plenty of sites um, for that. Um, but this little model that I've got here, I picked up at a car boot sale um, for five pounds with a 51.4. So I didn't realize at the time how lucky I was. And uh, I've rolled, put quite a few rolls of film for it. So it's a great camera and it's nice to use. As I said, the SRT 101 was revolutionary because of the way that it metered the scene. It also had something called, um, I think it's called CLC and it's actually marked on the front of the body. And what CLC meant was that it was kind of the first or one of the first zone metering systems as well because the uh, metering system was biased um, against um, landscape photos so what it meant was if you were sort of aiming the camera you know to take a to take a landscape photo the metering system knew that most of the time we're taking pictures where the sky is at the top and the grounds down below, and it would make sure that it wouldn't underexpose or overexpose by compensating for a really bright background, bright skyline, sorry, or you know, a dark foreground. So that was a really good, uh, a good way of way and a more advanced way of, of dealing with things. Probably the most famous photographers who used the SRT 101 was W. Eugene Smith and Annie Leibovitz always refers to the SRT 101 as her first proper um, camera. But, you know, don't worry, SRT 101s can still be had for very reasonable prices. So next, let's take a look at eBay and uh, see what's out there. Okay, so let's have a look at eBay and see, you know, what we could buy an SRT 101 actually for. So here we've got... Um, this is ebay.co.uk for everybody in the UK or in Europe. So let's see, we've got, I've just done a quick search just for SRT 101 ending soonest. So what we've got, we've got one here for, it's got a 45 mil left two lens on. It's got a day left, no bids, 39.99, 10 pounds postage. So we're looking at 50 quid. Maybe we go for a little bit more. Camera body only, a tenner, still got a day to go. What else have we got down here? SRT 101 with 55mm f1.7 lens, two days left, two bids at £10.50. Somebody being a bit optimistic there, £150, but they do get a lot of stuff with it. 
Um, starting price of £80 on that one. Obviously, the prices of these cameras are going up. A um, couple of bodies there for a tenner. 50 quid SO or SRT 101B and 35 to 70 zoom lens. Interesting. Another body for 29.99. That's all right. Isn't it? Right, let's go over to eBay.com and have a look at that one. So, what have we got here for everybody in the States? So, two hours left, four bids, $26 with lens and a flash. Gosh, not bad, not bad, is it? Minolta SRT 101 camera and two lenses and flash and filters. Nine ninety nine, four hours left. Um, Sixty dollars there. Twenty five dollars. Wow. So that's pretty good. So you see, you know, you can you can pick um, these cameras up pretty cheap on uh, on eBay. But I would also say that. Um, one of the most satisfying ways of, of buying cameras is from car boot sales, from thrift shops, from charity stores. And don't forget your relatives and friends. You know, ask them, has anybody got any old film cameras lying around? Remember, the SRT 101 was incredibly popular. They sold hundreds of thousands of these things. And so there's lots of them hanging around in people's um, um, attics and wardrobes, probably in a camera bag, because it would be the enthusiast who bought, bought one of these and they would have looked after it. Um, it wouldn't have been cheap when it was new, and although they're cheap now, you know, they're still worth looking for. But if you are lucky enough to find one in a shop or on a stall, um, you know, what should you look for when you buy it? So I think what, we, what, what we're checking for is basically that the camera is mechanically sound. Um, and so the first thing I think you should uh, have a look at is just have a look at the body. Just have a look, look around and see, you know, are there any big dents or dings or scratches? I mean, the scratches we're not really bothered, bothered about. Cosmetic stuff we're not bothered. But if there was like a big dent in it, which mean, meant that you couldn't get it open. I mean, for example, with this particular one, the plastic cover on the film wind is missing. But, you know, what the hey, I don't care about that. But everything seems, you know, it looks nice and clean. Have a look through the viewfinder. Does it look nice and clear? Um, you won't be able to see this on the video, but again, it would probably be dirty, um, but you at least you want to be able to check that you know there's no <laughs> dead things inside the viewfinder which are stopping you having a, having a look inside it. Um, pop the lens off. Obviously, ask the person who's got in the shop if you if you can do this or not. Um, and what you want to really want to do is we want to make sure it works. Now, when you first take a lens off, you might like turn the focus ring and turn the apertures, and then you can start to see what, that things move. Um, let's, let's just see, just make sure that you can see this properly. So this is a 50 uh, 1.4. And so all I'm doing there is I'm just turning the apertures. So it goes down to F16. And it's nice and smooth. It's not getting stuck and it opens up all the way to F1.4, which I think is really, really cool. Um, I can turn the focus ring and that's really nice and smooth, not notchy at all. And you know, I've already teched it, but again, I can see that the apertures turn smoothly. That's the little control bit that closes everything up. And then if I kind of look through the lens, um, there's no obvious scratches. Again, any scratches or, or cosmetic damage to the front lens doesn't matter one bit, even, you know, ones to the back that they can cause more of a problem. But, you know, I mean, this is a 51.4. What a fantastically beautiful lens it is. Fungus can be hard to see if you, if you don't know what you're looking for, but it's almost like a rippling effect. You know, it, it's not like the stuff that grows on bread, fungus you get in lenses. It's very, very fine. But to be honest, even if there is a little bit of fungus, it will just make your photos look more cool anyway. So I wouldn't really worry about it like that. So let's pop the lens back on. Um, what you can, the way that you do it with uh, Minolta's is you see there's a little red dot there on 101s and normally the lens will have a little red dot there on there but this one's fallen off <laughs> and then you just turn it clockwise and that's the release there, that's the thing you turn to, turn to do it. So, um, so I've popped the lens back on, um, so you know, let's do some mechanical checks on the body as well. So if you turn the lever and does it fire? That's good. Um, that's fine. If you look at the uh, 
a, a shutter selector, shutter speed selector. Does that turn nicely? As you can see, it does. Now up here as well, this is where you select the ISO of your film. So if you pull that up and turn it, does that turn nicely? Can you select the correct ISO? So that works. That's really good. And while we're here, if we put in a thousandth of a second and then we fire it off and then we turn it down to one second Actually, I'll tell you what I'm going to have to do. I'm just going to have to release this because I've actually got an old roll of film in there um, that I've got to release first. And then that will pop off like so. Let's just take that back a little bit. There we go. And so when I fire this now, obviously that changes it too. And you want to go through the different shutter speeds just to listen for that difference in timing. Now with the old cameras, especially ones that are sort of 40 years old, don't expect perfection. The shutter speeds probably won't be exactly right, but again, that adds to the character of the film. Um, now, let's turn the camera upside down now and have a look at the button. Um, if you see here, we've got our uh, uh, light meter uh, selector to turn it on and check the battery. Let's turn it up the right way so you can read it. Battery check off and on. And then we, you know, we can turn that with our finger. We've got our tripod and this is where the battery goes to change it. So what we're going to do first is we're just going to turn battery check on now. I'm going to see if this works. See if I can get you to look through the viewfinder. And actually you might be able to see. Let's see if you can see in the, into the viewfinder. Right. Down the bottom which you probably, it's a bit tricky this. All right, there you go, you can probably just see that. There you go, see that little needle right in the middle? That's the light meter. And you can probably tell that it's just, if you look, go to the right of the light meter, see it's lined up with a little bump in the side of the viewfinder. That means the battery's fine. Um, and in fact, if I turn it off and we look again, you'll see the needle's gone back to its resting position. See if we can see that. Can we see that? There we go, see the needle is right at the top now. And now if I turn the battery, uh, the light meter on, we should be able to see, there's the right hand side, oh, this is very fiddly, my apologies, this is a bit crap, isn't it? Here we go. Where's the meter? The meter's there. So, if I change the aperture, what you should be able to see is that that needle moving, maybe. I don't think you can actually. It's too tricky, isn't it, to to see it through here. I'd need some sort of macro lens to do this, wouldn't I? But anyway, if you were looking through that lens, you would then see that um, that, that basically what what happens is there's a little lollipop with a round bit on, and as you change the aperture or the shutter speed, that lollipop moves up and down. And the idea is to get the light meter needle into the middle of that lollipop, and that tells you you're going to get a uh, acceptable um, exposure that way. Now, if the light meter doesn't move, you know, don't panic. It's not the end of the world because they do fail, but because this is a, this is a mechanical clockwork camera, uh, everything will work even if the light meter doesn't. All that means is, you know, you might need a new battery and there's lots of stuff online um, about uh, getting the special batteries for these because originally these used mercury batteries you can't get anymore and there's all sort of adapters and different things you can get but I would say just pop in a PX625 battery, alkaline battery and you'll be good to go. Um, yes the exposure might be off but you know the shutter speed probably isn't going to be exactly right anyway so it doesn't particularly matter. It won't particularly matter or you can always use an external light meter which works very simply as well. And just remember that with a camera that's 40 years old you know, muck around with it gently and don't be too picky. You know, as long as the mechanics work and the camera is usable, even if the light meter turns out not to work, again, you can still, again, you could use a light meter, or you could use the Sunny 16 rule, um, or even you could use a light meter app on your phone.
So there we go. They're the main things to look at when you're buying uh, a Minolta SLT1 or indeed any sort of 35mm uh, film camera uh, at all. Okay, so in this section, I'm going to talk about how you actually use the Minolta SRT 101. I'm going to show you how easy it is um, and what a fantastic uh, piece of kit it actually uh, can be. Um, now, it's a fully manual clockwork camera. Um, the only electronics are in the light meter. And as I've said before, if that does fail or the battery goes flat, it doesn't matter. You know, there's plenty of other um, ways of, uh, ways of uh, working out your, your correct exposure. But what it does mean is we're going to have to input our ISO uh, of our film or the ASA of our film, you know, how sensitive our film is to light. And we're going to have to dial in the right shutter speed and the aperture combination to get uh, a correct exposure or an acceptable exposure. And it's really going to help us to think about um, the artistic choices we make as well. So shutter speed, you know, do we freeze the action or do we blur it a little bit? And aperture, do we go for a soft out of focus background or do we go for a scene where, you know, it's really sharp front to back. But let's let's take a little bit, little um, step backwards. Um, and let's actually get some, uh, let's get some film into, into this beast. So to, um, open up the back of the camera what you do is you just pull this bit thing up here and that will release the back and there we can see um, into the SRT 101 I've got an old roll of film here this is kind of my test roll that I use for um, demoing um, loading cameras so we shut that up it's always a bit fiddly to do this but basically all I'm going to do is just drag this across and feed it behind these little catches here. <laughs> you probably, there we go, so I'll just pop that all the way in. And then what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to wind the camera on and then keep firing. Now, whenever you're loading a film camera, actually, you might think, well, wait a minute, doesn't it get all curly here? Well, that's what the pressure plate's for. That kind of presses down on the camera and makes it nice and flat. So as you can see, it's loaded up. So we close up the back and then we, there's a little window here we can look at. We just want to keep firing and advancing until we get to one. Now here's a little hint as well. If you ever want to know whether you've loaded your film correctly, don't look at, just look at this bit, look at this. Because if this turns, it means that we have loaded the film correctly. There we go, it's turning, so the film is loaded and it's firing. We've got a live camera. So that's, so that's good. So we're ready to take some photographs. So let's wind the film on so we're ready to shoot. Um, and now what we've got to really do is just think about um, our uh, aperture first, I guess. I mean, as you come to use the cameras, you, you'll come up with your own, own way of thinking. But um, this particular film I've put in, I think, was it ISO 400? I think it was, so let's just make sure that's right. So we change the ISO by turning this little dial here. Can you might be able to see. See, there's 800. So that is now set to 400. So the camera knows the sensitivity of the film. And let's say, I don't know, I'm going for a nice portrait. So I'm actually going to set the camera's aperture to uh, f2.0. Not 1.4, let's go to f2.8. So we're good to go there. So now I need to meter the scene. So I'm gonna give this another go. Let's see if you can actually um, see this meter moving. So I'm gonna turn the light meter on. Now, can you see the needle through the viewfinder? Oh, I think you can. You can just about see it there, can't you? There's the little lollipop. And there's the viewfind, there's the needle. So I need to change my shutter speed to make that needle get in the middle of that lollipop. There we go. Well, it's pretty close, isn't it? So did you see the light meter move? Let, let me, let me, uh, so if I, so, so we're going out, we're going the wrong way there. There we go. And they matched up. So now I know my metering's correct. So now I can just, do my focusing and take the picture. How cool is that? How simple is that? And we're ready to wind on and shoot the next shot. Now let's imagine then that our light meter doesn't work. So let me turn the light meter off on the bottom of this so I don't waste my battery. 
that's off there. Let's say you like meter doesn't work. You know, how can you use the SRT, SRT 101? Well, the first kind of thing you could do is you could use the Sunny 16 rule. Now, the Sunny 16 rule means that um, all you have to think about is, and know, is the ISO of your film, or the ASA of your film. So in this case, it's, it's ISO 400 film. And the Sunny 16 rule says that if we're out and about on a sunny day, our shutter speed, if our aperture is um, f16, our shutter speed will be one over our ISO of our film. So on a sunny day with ISO 400 film in, at f16, my shutter speed should be as near to 1 500th, well, 1 400th as possible. So a 500th to underexpose, 250th to overexpose a little bit. And so if it's, if it's a little bit um, overcast, you could then go down to, say, f8, or slow your shutter speed down to, say, uh, 1 1 25th. And you can compensate that way. Um, and that works fine. And remember, with things like color film, when you take it to the developers to get it um, um, de <laughs> developed of all things, there's, a lot of, there's an incredible amount of latitude for over- and underexposed photographs. It really does work very, very well indeed. Or the other thing you might want to use is an external light meter, which I have just got here somewhere. Where did I put it? So I brought it down and it is on the side behind me. <laughs> here it is, I know I put it somewhere. So let's just move the camera just for a second. So this is an external light meter, um, incredibly easy to use. All you need to do with this thing is open it up and let's just make sure that you can see this properly. So you can see it there. And first things first, I just want to change the, and these light meters, they all work differently, but if you go on the internet, you can always find the instructions or work it out. So I'm just gonna change the ISO. So it's ISO 400. So it's the same as what my, um, my film is. Then all you do is you point the light meter at your particular subject. And what the way that this one works is it then gives you an exposure value. So if I then point this at the, these lights up there, I'm looking for the needle to move. Now, the needle's not moving, so what I do, there's an extra bit I bring there. So if I turn that over there, and that needle's moved. Now I'm just gonna move it close to the light because we're inside, so it's pretty dark. Fact, let me do it close to this computer screen. All right, let's do it closer to the bulb. Okay, so you won't be able to see that, but it actually went up to three. So all I do now down here is I then just move this dial to three and this then tells me my aperture and shutter speed combination. So with a 1.4 lens, I should be somewhere in between a 500th or a 250th. Uh, but say I'm shooting at f2.8, I need to be at 1 one twenty fifth. So then I just get my camera. I set the aperture to f2.8, which it already is. And I my, change my shutter speed to 1 1 25th. That is really, really simple, isn't it? So even if you've got an SRT 101 where the light meter doesn't work, you know, just buy an external meter, or you know, you can get lots of apps for your smartphone as well, and you'll be good to go. So the next thing to consider, I guess, is what sort of films might you want to put through your SRT 101? Um, because there's quite a few different things out there and different types. And if you're new to 35mm film photography, it can be a little bit intimidating. So I think probably um, you want to start off with good old just colour film, Kodak colour film. It doesn't really matter which one or, Il or um, I was going to say Ilford colour film, but they don't make one, or Fujifilm colour film or anything. Preferably don't go for out of date stuff when you start off. Go for something that is in date because you want to give the camera a really good chance to take some nice photographs. And always remember that first roll of film you put through the camera, you will make some mistakes. You'll also find out whether the shutter speed is really kind of out. Um, but at least if you've got good film in there, when you get it developed, if the camera is you know half decent and is gonna half work, you're gonna get some really nice photographs out of it. So you know maybe choose you know a nice color film to start off with. Then I think you want to try this stuff. Now this is Ilford XP2 400. This is a special black and white film. So you use this film, you get black and white shots. However, it's a C41 black and white film. What that means is you can take it to get it developed at the same place you take your color film, whether that be Boots, Asda, Walmart, 
um, your local chemists or if you send it off and you'll get beautiful back beautiful black and white photographs because they've been developed in the same color chemistry really cool stuff that a great way into black and white photography as you get more advanced or you know if you want to try it out you may when the, may well want then to move on to things like i don't know ilford pan f plus or basically this is a traditional black and white film that requires traditional black and white developing which you tend to do at home to be honest you don't tend to do this don't tend to send it off but you, you know you can send it off to to specialist labs and they will develop it so there we go they're the types of films to uh, to look for and i would say when you're starting again just go with a nice color film put it through go out and shoot on a nice sunny day um you'll get amazing results and then if you want to try a bit of black and white go with something like ilford xp2 400 a c41 black and white film to dip your toes into the wonderful world of monochrome photography let's talk about lenses as I said before, I was really lucky when I got my Minolta SRT 101 that I got it with a 50mm um, f1.4, which is an amazingly fast lens, which means that it lets in lots of light, basically. So even when you're inside, um, you can normally get away with not having to use flash if you've got a steady hand. But don't worry, you know, you don't have to have a 51.4. Um, the standard lens is like the 518s, or the, I think they do like a 55 and a 52 that might be a little bit slower to f2.8, f3.5. They're all fine. I would say if you can, try and stick with prime lenses. So these are lenses that aren't zooms. Not that the zooms of the day were terrible, but you know, when these cameras were coming out, you know, and over the next 10 years, you know, into the mid seventies, zooms really, uh, they're, they're quite heavy. They tend to be very, very slow. And you might as well take the advantage of having a nice quality, um, uh, prime lens. So the other ones that I've got uh, that are kind of tracked down over the over the years was 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 a wider angle lens. This is a MC Rockor 28 millimeter f 3.5 lens. Um, so you know, Minolta were known with their rocket lenses for producing very nice pieces of glass, and the 28 millimeter just gives me that wide angle view. Now you may well be saying, well, wait a minute, on my digital SLR the wide angle is like a 18. To, you know an 18 to 55 an 18 but remember that's because it's a crop sensor body on a full sensor body or a film body 28 millimeters is pretty wide um, and I find you know I can use that for architecture or anything where I need to get a little bit further back and that really is a very nice lens indeed and although the 50 millimeter is a very nice portrait lens because you can open it up to uh, f1.4 this is a very very special lens indeed this Oop, there goes the lid, is a MC Rockor 135mm f3.5. And again, you may be saying, whoa, you know, on my digital SR, 135mm is a real telephoto lens. And it is, but remember, again, that's because you've got a crop factor. So your 50mm is more like a 75mm, and something like 135mm is more like a 200mm lens. But on a full-frame body or a film camera body, such as the... Uh, Minolta SRT 101, the 135 millimeter is a very, very nice focal length for portraits. Um, and you remember it's f3.5, but it's f3.5 at the long end as well. So it's letting in plenty of light. And they really are a joy, these MC Rockor lenses. You can see we've got an all body construction, um, a nice rubber ring for the focusing, and we've got a nice metal lens mount built to last. When you're looking at lenses, um, I know we talked about it when we talked about the camera, but you really want to be checking that the aperture, aperture blades can open up and close up all the way and don't get stuck. Check the lens for fungus. We're not really worried about if there's uh, a little bit of it, and we're not really worried about um, scr little scratches on the front. We just want to make sure that the focusing is nice and smooth. Something else you might want to consider, though I have to admit I haven't really used it that much, is one of these babies. This is a tele teleconverter. Um, lots of this stuff I just pick up cheap at car boot sales. This is a solid gore one, so I don't know exactly how well it could be, but what this does is it doubles the focal length of any lens it's attached to. So it means my F, uh, sorry, my 135mm becomes a 270mm, which is quite a nice um, zoom. 
sorry, a nice telephoto to really get in there to see the details if maybe I was doing some wildlife photography. And as you can see, it has an extra element inside which magnifies everything. And it also has all the little levers, which means that as you're changing the aperture on your lens, it can go back and, um, and make sure the, uh, sorry, it can go back and make sure that the, um, metering system is still working that way. Um, and so there we go. There's a good choice of some lenses you may want to look at. I may want to look at recording. Um, maybe, sorry, may want to look at, uh, getting, uh, for your Minolta SRT 101. Now, flash photography with the SRT 101. Here we go. <laughs> now, one of the problems with flash photography when it comes to film is obviously you don't get the instant feedback of digital. Um, because one of the great things about digital cameras is they've kind of taken the mystery out of flash photography because you, you, you do have fully automatic flash systems where you can have the flash off the camera or on the camera and between them they will work out a fantastic exposure and get really good looking photos. And even if you have a manual focus flash uh, or a manually powered flash, sorry, and you've got to change the settings, basically you take one photo, you can see whether it's too bright or too dark and then you can change it where with the old film you know you've got to get it right so it was always really nervous when you were when you come to doing it but what we've got here is we've got the Minolta SRT 101 and I've um, put a, a small flash on the top of it this is the this is a Helios flash a Helios 32 which normally uh, I would use on my Olympus trip 35 camera but as you can see in order to use the flash on the SRT 101, you've got to have a lead that goes from the, the sync port to the flash because in fact, if I take the flash off, you can see that although we've got an accessory shoe on the top, it's a cold shoe. When you fire the shutter, nothing happens here. There's no contacts. And so the flash can't fire. And so there's no point putting one of your uh, automatic flashes on here from, uh, or you know from your, your digital SLR um, you definitely don't want to do that and in fact if you do put a flash on there it must be a flash that does have the sync port so that you can fire it and then all you do is you just plug it into there and then you know we're good to go and we can have um, flash photography so what do you do how does it work well the first thing is you make sure that you turn your shutter speed to a 60th of a second because that's the sync speed so that's the speed at which when the shutter fires and the two sort of the, the, the curtains come across the, the way that they work on an SLR is you have two curtains you press the button one curtain comes across and then the other one follows it um, and then in order to get higher shutter speed the second curtain starts coming across before the first curtain gets to the end and so in fact what you've really got is you've got a slit that's going across the scene like that which is fine for normal photography but when you have flash photography it means you then see the, the shutter coming across so a 60th of a second is the maximum speed at which the, that shutter is all the way open before the other one comes across so you set it to a 16th, 60th of a second and then you need to look at your flash and it'll have some sort of guide on the back like this one does sometimes it's a dial and with this one it says ASA times 10 and so you set this slider to the sensitivity of your film so I know I've got 400 speed film in there so I've set it to 40 just there It'd be very difficult to see on the video it's set to 40 and then up here we now then have the combination of um, distances and uh, apertures so I know that if I'm shooting in feet if my subject is 10 feet away I want to be at f11. So my shoot, my, uh, let's say my subject is uh, three meters, ten feet away. I would then change my aperture to f11. Or you know, if I wanted to shoot shoot wide open, uh, f2.8. In fact, I can't really. I'd have to be at f, say f3.2. My subject would have to be forty feet or sort of twelve meters away. And then you kind of all set up, wind your film on, and then fire. 
there we go. So flash photography, not particularly, not that complicated. I'm not a big fan when it comes to flash photography and film because I'm always, again, a little bit nervous, but as long as you follow the basics, um, it will work. I'm more of a fan of uh, slapping a really fast lens on and seeing what happens that way. But I'm gonna show you something that you may want to try instead, which I think is really, really cool. So let's get rid of this um, flash off the camera. Let's turn it off and fire it off. Um, okay, so let's get, the, uh, let's get the batteries out of this one because I'm gonna need them to use a different light source. And so the light source we're gonna use is an LED light, a constant light. So let's pop these in. Um, hopefully I'm going here we go, we're good to go now. Now, this is amazing this. So let's just put this onto the camera, lock it on. Now watch this. So I've got my 51.8 lens on there. And I can turn my light on. So now I've got a constant light source. Now it may not be super bright, but trust me, with a 51.4 or 51.8, if you get your subject pretty close and then dial out that big aperture, you're gonna get some great looking photos because these really are quite bright. Up close though, inside, you know, once you get beyond probably, uh, probably five feet, you know, that it's not really adding much light to the scene at all. But I would suggest, you know, if you're really into taking photos inside, you know, why not give this a crack? It gives you a really modern kind of uh, look, uh, kind of a fashion look with, you know, very, can be quite flattering as well to people because, you know, it tries to get rid of most of the shadows. And in fact, normally with the kits that these sort of ring lights come with, um, there'll probably be a uh, adapter where you can mount it straight onto the lens like that, which gives you really good effects. But again, these aren't true ring flashes because again, it is a light, so it gives you a constant light source. So, you know, you do have to bear in mind that you've got to be pretty close. But another thing to think about if you're into using artificial light to make your photographs look better. Okay, so um, we've covered a lot of ground now, but let's look at some of the more advanced features and some accessories that you might want to get for your SRT101. Sorry about that, my phone just made a, made a bleep. So, um, first things first, depth of field preview. Very a nice advanced feature, this. So... You know, when you're taking photos, one of the problems that you have is that when you look through the viewfinder, in order to be able to focus with the SRT 101, obviously, yeah, in fact, I don't think I've even mentioned this yet, have I? As you're focusing, there's a little shimmery bit in the middle that when something's out of focus, it kind of shimmers and you just turn your focusing ring until uh, it's nice and sharp. Nice and easy to do that. But anyway, when you're focusing, you're focusing with the lens wide open. So if you're trying to do a landscape shot or, shot or some sort of shot where you're shooting F8 or F16, you don't really know what the depth of field really is because you're looking at the scene at F1.4, F1.8, whatever the maximum aperture of your lens is. But the depth of field button helps you to see this. And so what happens is, and you might be able to see this on the close-up camera, that's the depth of field button there. So I'm about to take a picture. So all I do is let's um, close it up to, I don't know, yeah, F16. So all I do now is I then press that and you should be able to see, did you see that, the aperture close up? There we go, so I can really have a great idea of what the scene would actually look like. See? Now you have to have wound the film on for that to work. That was a really quite advanced feature at the time and then we fire the, fire the shot off and we're good to go. The other sort of feature that we can look at is this little button here. Now this, when we turn it, this is the mirror lockup again. I think we have to be wound on when we do it. But we turn that, and that actually locks the mirror up. In fact, it'd be probably easy for us to see it if I take the uh, take the lens off. There we go. Now, normally, what the camera would look like is that. If you can see, see the mirror there, and when we take a photo that jumps up out of the way. But the, that action of it going like this and jumping up out of the way makes the camera move a little bit, even when you're on a tripod. And so by turning this little lever here, you should see the mirror jumps up. So when we actually take our shots, oh, that was just the shutter moving there. 
it wasn't it wasn't the mirror now obviously when we've got the mirror locked up we can't see anything either so you tend to be working on a tripod where you know where things are but if ever you um, go to use your camera and you can't see anything through the viewfinder and you check your uh, lens cap and your lens cap is off chances are you'll have uh, knocked the um, the mirror hold up button and uh, that will be causing the problem um, the final thing actually is probably the shutter delay so if, if we want to get ourselves in the picture we can just turn that lever just down there press the shutter and then uh, normally that would uh, let's have a look what have I done I've done something to it all right you've got to press that I think and that is now going to wind round, and when it hits there, it's going to fire the shutter. Honestly, it will. There we go, and it did it. How good was that? Now, let's take a look at some accessories, because you've probably been looking at my SAT 101 and saying, what's this funny thing on the front? Well, this is a Kokin filter holder for the Kokin A system. Um, and the first kind of accessory you can get for it is a lens shade, which you can put on. Makes the camera look a bit different, doesn't it? But you can put these square filters on and I've got kind of a selection of square filters and round filters here so you could uh, see them. Um, this first one is a graduated filter. So the idea with the graduated filter is that you put it on the, um, put it in the holder like so. You can kind of see that. And wherever the horizon is, you kind of line the filter up. And that makes sure that the top of the sky doesn't get too overexposed and you still get plenty of detail. And obviously you can move it and change it depending on if you're shooting landscape or portrait. You can get these really cheap on eBay now. Because people, digital photographers don't use them because you can, you would add all this stuff in, in post-processing. Um, this one here is a, uh, it's like a diffuser. So the idea is the middle of the photo is nice and sharp and then you have a diffusion around the sides. You might be able to, you can kind of get the idea if I put it over the webcam, kind of like that. And again, you mount it in. And with the coking filters as well, you know, you could mount sort of two filters at the same time. You know, it's more than capable of doing that. And you don't lose too much light. The filters, they're, you know, they're made of plastic, but as long as you keep them in the cases and look after them. Um, what else have we got here? We've also got a coloured filter. That's a nice um, sepia, I think this one is. Sepia to make the photos. If you put that on colour film, it'll make it look old. And I haven't got any here, but I've got lots of like reds, yellows and greens. I mean, a typical a red filter will make black and white photos especially look, have more contrast in, especially against the sky, and they can be very good. But then you also get your round filters with coke and stuff as well. And this particular one here, that's a star filter again. You won't be able to see anything, but it's basically covered in little scratches so that if you take any pictures of bright lights, it will make them appear like a star. Um, and that's a one, one, two, three, four, five, an eight pointed star. But probably the most useful filter, which is still useful um, in photography today with digital cameras, is a polarizing filter. And this is the type of filter that um, enhances your pictures by uh, reducing glare and all you do is you snap that in there and then you can turn the filter to get the desired effect because you have to need to turn it um, to find the right uh, strength that, that you'll want depending on the angle that you are from the sun and that can work with color photography or black and white photography it enables you to see you know underneath uh, through the glare on water um, and generally do pretty magic things. So, you know, look out for coking, coking filters uh, with, with something like the lens you would get on the Minolta's. You really want the coking A system, the smaller system rather than the coking P, B, uh, P system. And then the final little thing I have here is this is a close up filter, which is really useful. And basically, it's, a, it's like a magnifying glass for your lens. And so you screw this on the front. If I put that over the webcam, you can probably see how it's magnifying. The scene that's the normal scene and you just screw that on the front instead of the coking system and you've got like an instant macro lens so there we go there's some really uh, sort of interesting accessories that often you'll probably find in the camera bag with the camera if you're buying a second-hand one 
um, and it's worth getting them uh, second hand off eBay and places like Gumtree too. So hopefully I've whetted your appetite for the most wonderful SRT 101 and giving you an uh, idea of you know, really why it's such a great camera, um, where you could buy one, how much roughly to pay, what to look for if you're buying a second hand one and you're lucky, lucky enough to put your hand on it before you actually have to part with your cash and how to use it and some of the accessories you might want to get to get the most out of it as well. I love my SRT 101 and I wish I had more time to shoot with it. Um, and <laughs> I don't know, I mean, I haven't really talked about this before, but can you imagine the day when there's a Kickstarter project that actually works and comes to fruition where you can add a little sensor into the back of these cameras where the film goes so you know you could get like a 12 megapixel turn them into a 12 megapixel digital camera as well that would be absolutely fantastic but as it is you know film is beautiful analog is uh, beautiful and uh, i love the randomness of what you get out of film photography so if you see one going cheap snap it up um, you definitely won't be sorry as i said before it will teach you more about photography just putting a couple of rolls of film through one of these babies than at, you know 50 pounds worth of modern photography magazines okay so that's it from me thank you for hanging around i know this has been a long video but i really wanted to go in depth into this camera um, because i really do in, do enjoy it if you enjoyed the video please subscribe um, and uh, add a comment down below i really enjoy those or you can email me scalespeeder at gmail.com um, check out robnonphoto.com for more of the same and also obviously check out the YouTube video stream for lots of different videos about different things and uh, hopefully I'll see you again really soon